Greetings in the name of the Lord. We continue with our study in the scriptures with regard to the topic of polygyny, that practice where a man has more than one covenant, more than one wife uh, in his family. We've gone through a number of passages, but I want to remind you at this particular point of some of the prefatory things that we talked about, specifically the issue of burden of proof, and I stated that at the time that since the burden of proof rests upon the person who lays a charge, that since the charge is that polygyny is a form of the sin of adultery, those who oppose polygyny have the burden of proof. And I think we can see that in the case of uh, this, uh, these particular passages, that we haven't really found anything that firmly convinces us that polygyny is wrong. What we found is a lot of guilt by association, a lot of this comes before this and isn't this bad, so this must also be bad, and so forth. Uh, we're not finding a verse that really substantiates the idea that polygyny is wrong. Now we're going to look at one that's a little different. This is really what you might call the great hope of the anti-polygyny folk because this passage deals directly with at least one kind of polygyny. Uh, what kind does it deal with? Well, let me read the verse to you from the New American Standard Bible and then we'll talk about uh, interpretations of this verse. It may take us a little while to go through this material, so hang in there with me and we'll be able to show you some examples on the screen of uh, the kinds of things that I'm talking about because some of the argument uh, relates to structure and grammar and so forth. Leviticus 18.18 18 reads, You shall not marry a woman in addition to her sister as a rival while she is alive to uncover her nakedness. Leviticus 18.18 18. It's argued by a few, and it is the, the very few, that this verse in Leviticus 18 is a prohibition of polygyny in general rather than what it appears to be, which is a prohibition of a particular kind of polygyny called sororal or consanguine or sister-sister polygyny. What are the arguments and are they convincing? And I want here to, uh, to again remind you of the fact that if this verse is lost to the anti-polygynist movement, then probably the Old Testament is lost to them. So let's take it slowly and see how we do here. What are the arguments that they offer? The first and probably their major argument is that the phrase a woman to her sister is idiomatic for a woman uh, to a woman. As in sister wives. The Hebrew they go to, on to tell us of this verse literally reads, You shall not take a woman to her sister as a rival to uncover her nakedness while the other is alive. And then they note that while taking two sisters was acceptable in Assyrian and Hittite cultures after the first sister died, they rejected taking sisters while both were alive. It is argued that a close reading of this law in its larger context places the traditional interpretation in doubt. Again, I remind you that that means that far and away the people who have translated this passage in the past don't agree with them. So they're opposing the traditional interpretation. And uh, I, you know, I, I say to you that of a whole list of interpretations in the, on these websites that give us multi-interpretations or multi-translations rather, uh, you will find that only one of them translates it the way that they want it to be translated. How do they want it to be translated? They want it to be translated, as I said, a woman to her sister woman, uh, to another woman. What they do then is to go to grammar and to instances of this phrase being used in the scripture, and they say this, all other eight uses of this phrase in the Hebrew Old Testament use it in its distributive idiomatic sense of one with another or one to another, one to another like the first one. So since the first one is a woman, uh, therefore should be taken idiomatically here as well, a woman to a woman. That's their translation. 
Now, all this sounds scholarly. You may be impressed with the idea that, boy, in the only eight other uses of it, it's, it's used in the way they want. Why shouldn't I go along with what they want? Well, we have a chart here for you to look at. And what you will see are the, uh, drawn from Davidson's work, uh, we have a chart that shows the location of these eight that they talk about, and they are the eight in black. And then you find the Hebrew uh, word uh, transliterated, and you find the referent here. Now, what is this text talking about? Uh, and then the translation. And the translation, you'll notice in every case, is each with her sister. So they're right, the same term is used. In the Hebrew, second column, it's the, uh, it's the same terminology that we find in Leviticus 18.18. 18. However, look at the reference to this thing, that column. The first, Exodus 26, is curtains that were used in the banking of the tabernacle. A curtain to its sister curtain. In Exodus 26.3b, curtain to a sister curtain. 26.5, loops of a curtain to other loops of a curtain. Or uh, take 26.6, curtains to other curtains. Same thing again. 26.17, projections of a frame to projections of a frame. Now we shift over to Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel chapter 1, we find two other instances of these two words together. We find the wings of the living creatures in the vision of Ezekiel touching their wings. Uh, again, it's feminine case. The wings touch the wings of the living creature, each with her sister. The wing, one wing with its sister wing, if you could put it that way. Same thing comes up again in Ezekiel 1.23, the wings of the living creatures. And in 3.13, again, the same thing, the wings of the living creatures. Those are the eight that he's talking about. All right, now he also gives in his book three more examples that are not the same thing, but he thinks that they are, are similar enough that he wants to mention those and bring those to our attention that it supports his case. Again, notice that two of them are in Isaiah, one of them is Jeremiah, uh, and in one case, the first two cases, it has to do with hawks or animals, each with its mate. And only in Jeremiah 9.20 do we actually have a reference to women where it would be translated each woman with her neighbor woman. And that's as close to what they're trying to say Leviticus 18.18 18 actually teaches. But notice that the word is different. We're no longer in the same word. So what about the way that he has analyzed the, uh, the case in the scripture? We find eight uses that are the same words and they are to be taken figuratively and descriptively and uh, what are we to make of them? Well notice two things. First they are largely located, the eight, in two narrow contexts in the Old Testament, Exodus 26 and Ezekiel 1 through 3. The second thing to notice is that they in both cases refer to non-human objects, either objects in the tabernacle or the living creatures in Ezekiel's vision. My friends, this, this kind of use of language study is a misuse of language study. Obviously, tent curtains don't have blood relatives. Neither do spiritual and visionary beings whose wings touch. To compare these instances to real live women is wrong-headed indeed. Uh, further, the fact is that uh, there, if there's a figurative or distributive use of a word or phrase, it implies that there's a literal and non-distributive use somewhere. And there is utterly no reason that the Leviticus passage, 18.18, isn't that literal and non-distributive use. Given the fact that literal sisters is, are used, the word for sisters is used in the very context, in the verses that precede Leviticus 18.18, 18, there is simply no reason to avoid the plain, literal meaning, and so the translators throughout history have done. As the hermeneutics teachers used to tell me when I took hermeneutics with them, if the plain sense makes sense, any other sense is nonsense. The plain sense makes fine sense in Leviticus 18.18, 18, and the attempt of Davidson and others to appeal to a figurative or distributive use 
is a byproduct of their prejudice against polygyny, not because they're doing really good scholarly study at this particular point. Put another way, to deny that sister means a literal sister but refers to another, female bears the burden of proof, and simply citing other instances where it is used in a distributive way is not a sufficient reason. It probably commits the logical fallacy you call the undistributed middle which is kind of like saying men are mammals and dogs are mammals and therefore men are dogs. Uh, not, not a good way to reason. To understand better what I'm trying to say, I would like to cite another group of verses that he cites, which is where a gender change takes place. Notice this particular uh, table. Here we have uh, the same word being used about 12 times. Uh, this has to do with men, so we've made a gender change. And we find it in Genesis uh, 37, 42, 42, and you can read it, uh, the different places where it's found. Now in these, we look at the referent one again, so once again, to what's being talked about here. The translation in Hebrew literally is a man to his brother and we find that some of them are similar to what we found before. Cherubim on the ark, for example, in Exodus 25 and 37. Uh, we find wine bottles down in Jeremiah 13. Obviously those are going to be distributive and they're going to be figurative. There are cases where people are discussed. Israelites in Exodus 16 and in Ezekiel 24 and 33. Israelites, a man with his brother and we understand that brother and even sister can be used in a broader sense. But let's go back, aside from Syrian soldiers in 2 Kings, to the Genesis passages that he brings to our attention. There we find Joseph's brothers being mentioned. Aren't we talking about a man with his real brother in those three cases? There we have, in that case, our literal meaning from which the figurative and distributive uses which follow it in Exodus, Numbers, Kings, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel come. So it seems to me that by citing the Genesis passages here, he's just defeated his own case because there we realize that real brothers, maybe half-brothers, some of them, but real brothers are at issue. The second thing they do is try to show that there is a structural relationship here between some of the verses which draws this abyss that they want to make an interpretation between verse 17 and verse 18. Why do they want to do this? They want to show that 18 aligns with the verses that follow rather than with 17 and the verses which precede it because that strips it away from the concept of incest or close, uh, close kin relationships. Uh, so what they do is they give a number of different arguments and I have listed them for you here. Look at them if I look down at my materials because this is technical study and I don't want to make a mistake in talking to you. Look with regard to the first group here, 7 through 17, what they say about it with regard to structure. They say that each verse begins with uh, the word for nakedness and ends with a negative particle and the word which means you shall unco uncover, which means you shall not uncover the nakedness of. All right. Secondly, the latter is in a nominal clause justifying the prohibition based upon the identity of the forbidden individual, except they acknowledge verse 9. The third argument that they give, or way of discussing the first seven, uh, the f 7 through 17, is that none of these has a time limitation on it, as does verse 18. So they're struggling here to find every nitpicking little thing that they can find. Fourth argument here, or fourth point to mention, is that each of these is about a, each of them that mentions a sister explains her relationship to the addressed person whereas they note that in verse 18, this is not so. Now look at the second group, that is verses 18 through 23. They make some comments about that. First, each verse begins with the word and in Hebrew and ends with a negative partic particle and some other verb than the one up there that talks about shall uncover nakedness. 
So they're saying, all we got to do is look at 7 through 23, and we realize that 7 through 17 is one group by these grammatical points that we have made, and 18 through 23 is another grammatical group, and so 18 being closely, more closely related to the group that follows it, therefore we, we shouldn't feel like we have to associate the word sister in 18 with the use of the word sister on three occasions in between 7 and 17. All right, now, how does that work out in reality, and do their arguments and the points that they note really work and make sense? I have repeated the same uh, outline that he gave before. This is uh, Davidson and a former student of his named Tosato, and uh, made a response to them. To the note that each verse begins with uh, nakedness and ends with a negative particle and says, you shall not therefore uncover, the problem with this is that the regulations are not divided into verses, but are independent laws, and in that regard it's to be noted that verse 17 is a double law, and the second regulation of it doesn't have the form that they are talking about. So they get their, it's all the same ending, by ignoring verse 17. Their second point that the latter is in a nominal clause justifying the prohibition based upon the identity of the forbidden individual, except for verse 9. Not only is verse 9 an exception, but verse 18 does identify the relationship to the forbidden person. That is, it says, this is your wife's sister. That shows the relationship. She's his in-law sister. So she shouldn't take, he shouldn't take her to his wife. That's an identification of the person with regard to the man who's being addressed. So I don't really see that their point there is, is correct. Then they say, none of these has a time limitation in it, in verses, uh, as verse 18 does. Well, okay, maybe literally, technically that's true, but if you were to go to verse 16, you would find that there is an implied limitation according to Deuteronomy 25 through 15. What's going on in Deuteronomy 25 through 15? Well, that's the Leverite law. And in that law, we find out that there is a right for a man to marry his sister, in fact, an obligation for him to marry his sister-in-law, if the brother has died. Well, that's the same time limitation as we find in verse 18 but they don't go into the relationship between verse 16 and the Deuteronomic passage, which shows that 16 had an implied time limitation. <clears throat> in the fourth instance, that each of these is about a sister, explains a relationship. Uh, it's not true. As we said, she is the sister of the hypothetical uh, person's wife. Again, it's the, uh, so none of these four, as far as I'm concerned, is very impressive to me. What about their points with regard to the second group? It is true that each of them begins in a very different way, and they end in a different way. At best, what this shows is that 18 is transitional and goes uh, into a new, and it helps us to go into a new section. Uh, however, there are too many similarities that I will point out in a moment between 18 and 7 through 17, especially 17, which makes this not a determining factor, as they argue that it is, but in fact there are better ways of looking at the structural differences in this verse. As far as the verse lacking the nominal clause, I'm back to the point I made up above under point two, that the exception to that is verse nine, and therefore their point that they are all the same in seven through seventeen is not so. These qualifications, I believe, substantially negate the point that they are trying to make. I consider the note uh, that they make about the and structure there for the difference between 18 and 17 to be the best point that they have to make. It does show an affinity to the rest of the section. However, uh, they completely overwork their points. It, it is, once again, the, the hermeneutics of desperation. The entire section is unified according to the phrase, the Lord spoke to Moses, that begins 18.1. And in 19.1, we find the new section beginning with the Lord spoke to Moses. So what we better try to do is show the relationship between 19 through 23 
with what goes before rather than trying to drive this terrible wedge, this abyss between 17 and 18. In Hebrew thought, relationships like this are associated with logic, with concepts, not just with grammar issues such as these men are suggesting at this particular point. Let's look at uh, another point that they make with regard to the structure of this passage. This is the structure they're trying to, to uh, drive at. Uh, and this is really my response to their structure. If you'll notice this particular one, you'll see that it, uh, it uh, has what is called an inverted parallelism or logical structure. And one of the things, the, the most important thing for you to notice are my subtitles in there after verse 6. Uh, which says, no man shall approach any close relative to have sexual relations with her, sexual intercourse, I am the Lord. Notice that 7 through 16, not 17, but 7 through 16, give us your kin as far as the close relation is concerned. But when we move to verse 17, we move to your wife's kin. They don't bring that out. They try to make it look like 7 through 17 are incest discussions, whereas 18 isn't. It turns out that 7 through 18 are all discussions of close kin relationships to the person who is being addressed. The biggest divide, if you want it, could come at 19, but probably comes at 20. Why do I say that? Because 19 talks about your wife still having sex with her during her menstrual period. And what it's saying in effect is when you deal with your wife, be careful of how you relate to your wife, your wife and her children or descendants, children, grandchildren, or her children or her and her sister, that's verse 18, and verse 19 is her and herself. You shall not do anything like is being spelled out to your wife in any of those three verses. Now, what is going on in those verses? We'll talk about that later. Let's talk about the third argument that they give. They say that all polygyny involves the creation of a rivalry, and therefore Leviticus 18.18 18 condemns the behavior of polygyny. Uh, here we have... Davidson quoting another author by the name of Gordon Hugenberger who makes this statement quoted by Davidson in his book. Accordingly, if the motive for this prohibition was to avoid vexation to one's wife, there is little reason for limiting its prohibition to a literal sister. Both the Bible and anthropology provide ample testimony to the unpleasant reality of contention among co-wives, whether sisters or not. Now, The reason why they want to bring this up is because the understanding that we should have of the grammar at this point, which uh, verb is a qual, is a call infinitive construct, means to make a rival. Not simply that a sister or sister wife would be a rival, which is what Gordon Hugenberger is saying here, <clears throat> but rather you shall not take one to make a rival. Now remember about Jacob, who did marry sororal sisters, he didn't marry them to create a rivalry. The rivalry that they experienced had to do with fecundity, it had to do with fertility, it had to do with progeny, and it only occurred when God closed Rachel's womb. And once that condition changed, when God opened it and gave her a sister, or gave her a child, then they, that we don't see any rivalry between the girls anymore after that. So while any poly situation could result in a rivalry, one which involves sororal sisters is, is the issue. Well, what's going on in that? Think about it for a moment. Just think about it, friends. What chapter 18, verse 18 is saying is that a man shall not take to his wife, her sister, in order to create a rivalry. How would you feel about it if you and your wife were not getting, or if you and your husband were not getting along, and then you found out that he had just decided to take your sister to bed? I think you would probably be rather outraged. And in fact, what we find here, I believe, is God saying no to using family members, her sister, 
in order to carry on a neurotic battle that you've got with your wife. It's like, boy, she really ticks me off, so what I'm going to do is marry her sister. Boy, that'll get her. Now, when we have that said, I think we also ought to understand that there is a good possibility that verse 17 also deals with the same issue. The, the NET Bible, in its footnote, says about verse 17 that to take a woman and her daughter or her granddaughter is a matter of lewdness. Here's what they say about lewdness at that point. The term rendered lewdness almost always carries a connotation of cunning, evil device, and divisiveness and is closely associated with sexual and religious infidelity. They go on. But wait a minute. Divisiveness? What that tells me is that the guy in verse 17 is told he should not marry a woman and her daughter and granddaughter because that would certainly create divisiveness in the family. However, marrying a woman and her sister would be a matter of actually doing it to really aggravate her. But it could be that both of these verses are trying to aggravate the wife, and so one is simply called lewdness, it's not to be done, and the next one identifies a rivalry in there. The issue in both of them would be using family members to divide a family, namely your wife from her family. Now, is that sort of thing worth a whole law? You bet yourself it is. And the reason for that is, go to Proverbs uh, chapter 6 and take a look and you will find that God says there are seven things I hate. You know what the seventh one is? It's dividing brothers, dividing a family. That is considered very heinous to him. And it's talking about brothers in a family at that particular point, not a distributive use. So I find verses 17, 18, and 19 to be in very good structural relationship to each other because they all relate to the wife. You will not use her family to divide her up, nor will you use her herself and her body to irritate her by saying, you know, let's have sex. And she says, well, honey, I'm having my period. And his response to that is, I don't care, I want to have it with you now. How embarrassing it would be for her, for him to have intercourse with her while she's having menstruation. I know that a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, that was a, a purity law. That was a law that they had in Israel, but it's not necessarily the way. No, 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 my friends. Leviticus 18 is a list of the sins of the Canaanites. Sins for which they are going to be vomited out of the land. The concept of misusing the blood goes all the way back to Genesis after the flood, or even before that to Cain and Abel when God says, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Involvement in the blood is a very serious thing to God because the life of the flesh is in the blood. So what this text is trying to tell us is God doesn't want you to attack your wife's sense of modesty and her private time by having sex with her during the period of time when she is having, having her period and she is expelling blood from her body. Now, there is still a very good reason for having these three verses associated with the verses that come before. And that is that 17 and 18 deal with close kin relationships, just like the, uh, the verses before deal with the close kin relationships to the husband. This relates to the husband through the wife. So, as I look at all of this sort of thing, my conclusion is that there is absolutely no reason whatsoever to go away from the traditional interpretation. In fact, if the traditional interpretation is wrong, it's wrong by saying that sororal uh, polygyny is being negated here. It's not even really sororal polygyny, that is consanguine sisters, but rather it is the problem of trying to create a rivalry with your wife by taking your sister to be a second wife. So it's very narrow. That's incidentally why they went to the trouble to try and argue about rivalry that, oh, you create a rivalry every time you have a relationship of polygyny. Really? 
Where do we find that back in the so-called law of first mention when we talked about Lamech and his wives? They got along fine. In fact, you'll find that of the 40 or so times where polygyny is mentioned, I think only three of them are cases of where there is a rivalry that is even mentioned in the text. The rest of the wives, just like Lamech's wives, seem to get along perfectly well with each other. So I'm not buying that idea that anthropology and, uh, and so forth always tell us that all these things always create a rivalry. No, sir, they don't. They didn't in the scriptural text. We shouldn't be using them in that way here. So what I find is that Leviticus 18.18 18 is against a kind of polygyny or a use of polygyny in a particular kind of polygyny, using the sister to harass a wife that you're obviously having trouble with by using her sister or close kin to do so. Now that certainly doesn't condemn polygyny as a whole. And if you're going to lean on this read, it's going to go up in your hand. This particular text should not be used as a text to prohibit polygyny in general.